Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the weekly video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel. I'm the founder of Migraine Nation, and I have a history of chronic and daily migraine that began at the age of four. We have a super exciting episode today. This is our monthly news episode with Dr. Tim Smith. Hello, Dr. Smith. How are you today? Doing well. Thanks for having me again. Well, thank you for being here. Dr. Smith is a regular, especially for our news episodes, because of his extensive experience in migraine clinical trials as the CEO of Study Metrics Research. Dr. Smith is also a board member of the National Headache Foundation. So we're very lucky to have him to talk to us about all the latest news, uh, medication approvals, et cetera, each month. So I believe we'll have a little bit of something for everyone in our episode today. Uh, we are gonna start with a study that was done on the eye of people with migraines. So many of us experience symptoms related to our eye with our migraine attacks, whether it's pain, redness, visual changes. And I've always personally found it really odd when people try to tell me that there's not actually anything physically going wrong or different about my eye when it feels so crazy every time I have a migraine attack. So there was a study published this month in Headache that reports that there may actually be some changes occurring in the eye during a migraine attack. So Dr. Smith, what did they find? Yes, so uh, these researchers looked at the retinal vessels, the circulation of the, the back of the eye, mm -hmm. uh, where all of your visual uh, images are uh, taken, uh, taken in and processed and sent to the brain for recognition. They used uh, something called OCT angiography. We'll get into too much of the details on that, except it's a uh, non-invasive way of looking at uh, the circulation, the vasculature, and the, the back of the eye and the retina, and uh, they can look at different measures. They looked at something called vessel flux index, and it's, uh, or, or um, FVI, is sort of a way of, of looking at perfusion, which means circulation, how much uh, blood is uh, going in, how big are the blood vessels, and how, how good is the circulation to the, the eye. And we, these investigators uh, showed that uh, dur during, and, and this has been used to study other things. And they use OCT to look at diabetic retinopathy. They use it to look at uh, glaucoma, other eye disorders. So, and they these investigators and others have been looking at using this uh, research tool to understand what's going on during migraine as well. The unique mm -hmm. thing that they did was they studied migraine patients during migraine attacks and then in between migraine attacks and looking at the differences. And they also compared them to non-migraine controls. So nicely designed study, really set up to kind of look at the differences. And they did show a, uh, a significant decrease in uh, this perfusion or our retinal circulation associated with migraine attacks. This was uh, really an interesting finding because if you think about it, the circulation to the retina this is just a branch off of the carotid artery, which mm -hmm. uh, gives the circulation to the brain as well. So you can kind of almost look at it as a surrogate for what's going on inside the brain as well. If it happens right. in the eye and you can measure it there, you can presume that similar things are going on inside the brain, only right. you just can't measure those there, not as finely as you can with this with this instrument. It's a very interesting phenomenon. It's the first physical phenomenon we've seen that uh, really kind of correlates with migraine and the eye. About 50, a little more than 50% of people do have visual changes with migraine. We know that some people have aura, only maybe about 20%, and they don't have it for every single attack. Mm -hmm. But about 50 or more percent will also report some blurring. This is kind of an interesting finding there. And the other interesting thing that they commented on in the discussion section was that they think that uh, in some ways this decrease in, in uh, retinal perfusion could be uh, responsible or associated with the, the light sensitivity that migraine patients experience. Right. Uh, and I thought that was novel and interesting. I had not thought about it in that way until these investigators brought that up. Right. So basically what that means, just to reiterate and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there was less blood going to the back of the eye during the migraine attack. Um, and, and that they think that that could be associated with our photosensitivity, uh, and, and our other symptoms that we experience in the eye. 
Uh, um, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time over the last two or three decades kind of debunking a lot of the vascular theories of migraine. Right. But I don't think we can go completely away from it. We know there's an association with how much causation is yet to be seen, but there could be subtle changes on this that may be responsible for more symptoms than we than we previously gave credit to. Right. Uh, that's another reason I found that paper very interesting. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving on to the, our next paper we're going to talk about. This one is for our friends in the cluster headache community. Whenever there's data reported on cluster headache, we always try to report on it. So uh, this group looked at the long-term effectiveness of occipital nerve stimulation, which is the nerves back here, and it is an invasive stimulator that's implanted. And they looked at the effects of this stimulator in patients with chronic cluster headache. So this study did have some limitations. It also did not have many patients. The sample size was rather small. But what was reported as far as the long-term effectiveness and quality of life, et cetera? Right. I think it's, uh, you, you point out the small number, and I think that's reflective of the fact that this is not a widely deployed intervention uh, for cluster headache. It's reserved for people with medication refractory or medication resistant uh, types of chronic cluster headache. And it is invasive, so it does require surgery to implant the uh, the electrodes to stimulate the, the occipital nerve. And so the stimulator was not an intervention for this study. They took pa patients that had these stimulators implanted, and then they did some long-term in-depth interviews with them, basically. They, they I think the average interview length was like 63 minutes. So this is a really long time to interview. And so it's a semi-structured interview type uh, questionnaire and, and associated uh, structured interview. And basically what they showed was that uh, regardless of the, you know, the numbers of, of cluster headache days or cluster headache attacks, the use of, of the stimulators for these chronic refractory patients showed an improvement in mood, improvement in energy levels, improvements in feelings of uh, self-control or being in control, uh, better social participation, more of a positive outlook and, and better acceptance of their condition. These are all in the, in the strict science world. These are kind of considered soft endpoints, but in the patient world, we really care deeply about those. And, and right. I think when we're evaluating an invasive procedure, you know, I think most of us would want to really know what our the benefits just besides, you know, cluster headache attacks, you know, how much is my life helped, uh, you know, and so I think that's, um, I appreciate the researchers doing this. It's a lot of work to do all those interviews and then compile, if you have to have linguistics experts to pull out all of these uh, different endpoints and, and really be able to analyze them. And so it's, it's yeoman's work, but I think it's, this was a nice paper about our the worst of our patient our, our chronic cluster patients who have the worst quality of life and require invasive to try to get some relief. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I was happy that they reported out on this. Yeah, it definitely showed some positive things for people who who need this this procedure. Um, another study was published this month for those of us who have gone to pain psychologists and have learned some of these techniques or have maybe learned some of them on their own. We have uh, things like cognitive uh, behavioral therapy and mindfulness. Now, I love this paper because they combined these. So this study was on something called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which incorporates components of both cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness meditation strategies to help decrease symptoms in people with migraine. So what did they find when they combined these two approaches? Yeah, so this uh, group, this is uh, Dr. Betsy Singh and her group. She's a well-recognized uh, PhD pain mm -hmm. psychology researcher, sort of a master of these non-pharmacologic interventions and uh, really a top-notch researcher in the field. And so they looked at these two are probably a couple of the most popular biobehavioral interventions, we call them the, the mindfulness uh, meditation. It's basically, it's sort of like transcendental meditation, but with a focus on being mindful of uh, your central nervous system, your body, where it is in the universe, what's going on in it, and how it affects how you feel, sort of like an auto-programmed biofeedback kind of thing without having mm -hmm. to put monitors on your body and things like that. And then the uh, the the uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, this is a term we bat around and for our viewership that doesn't really understand what it means, it's 
it's basically using your intellect and your knowledge and increasing your understanding of the literally the the pathophysiology what's going on in your body to understand how to fix it you know and mm -hmm. how to uh, how you can influence it on your own so it's you know your your how your actions can improve and how your thinking can improve your actions and and then how your actions also positive impact impact your thinking and your health too so these are interventions that they use and uh, put you know applying elements of both uh, really, and they measured something called the pain catastrophizing scale, and this is not something that doctors ordinarily do in the office, or that many of your, of our, most of our listeners probably or viewers have never really heard of this or paid attention to it unless they work in a research research shop, mm -hmm. or maybe if they participate in a study before, because we do right. these these scales in studies. Uh, sadly, we use them mostly to exclude people from the study if they have high, you know, catastrophizing scores. And arguably, these are the patients that need our help the most. Mm -hmm. They get uh, excluded from clinical trials. And I think the for most pharmaceuticals, kind of current thinking is that if you, if you have a high score on that, it's going to make you refractory to therapy. Yeah, what was great about this intervention was this uh, score was improved with the non-pharmacologic therapy. So. Uh, you know, these are some of the most studied techniques in the world and have, you know, many uh, decades of, of positive results in, in studies. Something like over 700 studies show the positive impact on migraine, refractory migraine right. itself. So, and I think this is just one more study that really shows the responses are real and may be very helpful even for patients that may be deemed lost causes as it pertains to medication. So. Mm -hmm. A lot can of food you, for thought. Can you, for people who don't really understand or don't know, and it's not really a popular term in among patients, but can you define catastrophizing, pain catastrophizing for us? Uh, so the, the questionnaire, you know, focuses on lots of things and sort of when you catastrophize something, it's what it exactly sounds like is, you know, um, a stressful event or an exposure or something um, it's almost like post-traumatic stress without the initiating event. It's sort of like worry, you know, every little thing becomes a catastrophe. It's, it's mm -hmm. amplified. And the, the, the scale, the, the PCS scale that they use is a validated, reliable instrument that's been studied and you can trust the analysis on it because it, it, uh, it, it does discriminate well on patients that, uh, are, you know, you could argue that their central nervous system is so sensitized and has such a heightened state of awareness, plus this background of having had dreadful, you know, uh, incapacitating uh, pain attacks. You know, it's it's easy to see how the brain can sort of glom on to that as an outcome, a forethought. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what it is. You you know, you're it's it's one thing to be in excruciating pain. But it's also another thing to live in in fear of excruciating pain and anticipating the worst. And right. so every little thing gets amplified. And it's a natural thing for the brain. It becomes, you know, it's it's a it's kind of a glorified way of of pointing out avoidance, you know, and avoidance behaviors. People will mm -hmm. will do that. You may say it's maladaptive coping, but if it works, you know, the brain becomes so sensitized, it's not like they do it on purpose. It's just right. the way the brain behaves, you know. So right. All right. Well, I wanted to make sure everyone understood that so that they understood what exactly the intervention was changing um, and because it's important yeah. and, and the intervention is a great one. It really does help. So um, I liked that data a lot. So let's move on to our next study. Um, this study showed a relationship between monthly number of headache days and quality of life and how this might be impacted by things like depression, anxiety, and allodynia. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, allodynia is like an increase in the perception of pain from a stimulus that normally shouldn't be painful. So if you were like me uh, and you had migraine as a child and you had allodynia, you hated it when your mother put your hair in ponytails or pigtails or combed your hair too much um, kind of a thing. So that's exactly what allodynia is. So so, uh, Dr. Smith, what did this study find exactly? So this is analysis that came out of the what we call the CAMEO study. This is a study that was done by uh, Richard Lipton and Don Buse and that great group of uh, researchers who have published, you know, hundreds of helpful 
journal articles and publications, uh, some of the top researchers in the world. And they took data from this database. This is a longitudinal database of people with chronic migraine. They look at a lot of influencing uh, factors and and relieving factors. And, and we've learned we've we've come to learn a lot from studies like this about things that cause uh, chronification of migraine, for example, and those kinds of things. And what they were looking at with this is sort of this relationship between monthly migraine headache days and quality of life. In a nutshell, it makes sense that if you have a reduction in your monthly headache days, you would have a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. And that is true, but it doesn't always track together exactly. And the suggestion right. is that quality of life is uh, determined by more than just the number of monthly migraine headache days you have. Yeah. Now, we really pay attention to the monthly migraine headache days in the research world because the FDA cares about that. The headache societies could care about it, and the insurance payers care about that. I think our patient constituency cares about it, but it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our people would say, I don't care how many days of migraine I have during a month as long as I can function. I mean, it's kind of a sad and desperate you know, way to look at it, but it's it's 100% true. Our, our patients don't uh, necessarily... Uh, think of the the migraine days as a predictor of their quality of life. And so with this um, severe popula population of patients, um, they used uh, some interesting statistical techniques, some regression techniques to look at how much of the quality of life is determined by mo monthly migraine headache days. And the answer is 24 to 32%. So I think a lot of people might say, well, monthly migraine headache days is going to account for at least 80% of my quality of life, but it yeah. turns out, you know, so it's sort of an interesting thing when they looked at other things that, that really showed up on the radar screen, uh, depression counts for 15 to 24% independent of monthly, you know, headache days, allodynia, you mentioned this was nine to 16%, you know, mm -hmm. so this is anywhere from eight, you know, one out of eight or one out of 10 uh, contributing causes. And then anxiety, also two to 6%. And then there was, the rest is just made up of a hodgepodge of other stuff that we can't even, or stuff that we don't even measure or don't even know right. how to measure. And that's still a substantial portion of the contributing uh, factors. So interesting study. I think it's great to kind of look at in terms of what's important to our patients and basically helping researchers and hopefully Policymakers, regulatory people understand, you know, the complexity of, of chronic migraine and the relationship to different factors of, of quality of life. You know, we can measure different domains. We can measure how much it restricts your activity, this and that. But understanding the reasons why is what this paper tries to get at. And I, I applaud the, the researchers for, you know, doing the research and uh, publishing their results. Yeah, I I love the study. I was a little bit surprised. I thought pain would have mattered more, uh, just in my experience. But um, I love that they did it. I love the data, and I'm grateful it's there. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to our news episode this month before we go? No, it's at the time of this recording. It's at the end of the year, so uh, <laughs> I don't know when this will air. But you know, the holiday season is here. I just hope everyone makes it through the holidays. It can be stressful. It can be fun. It can be everything in between. And uh, it's an interesting time for people who have uh, chronic debilitating um, headache disorders. And we just wish everyone all the best and look forward to a productive and happy and prosperous new year. And I uh, hope to see everyone uh, soon. Yes. Well, thank you for being here, Dr. Smith. And thank you everyone for joining us this week. And don't forget to tune in next week to the weekly video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. Bye everybody.